First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Yes? Oh, good morning, madam. I'm from Pestaway Market Research. I'm doing consumer research in this area. I wonder if you'd mind telling me, do you use Pestaway in your home? Pestaway? Oh, the insecticide thing. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. What do you use it for, madam? Fleas, ants, cockroaches, woodworm? Oh, cockroaches. This is an old house, you see, and we often get cockroaches in the kitchen. I tried scrubbing and disinfecting, but it didn't seem to do much good. And then I heard a commercial about Pestaway, so I thought I'd try that. Was that on TV? No, it was radio, one of those early morning shows. You heard it advertised on the radio? Fine. And you say you use it in the kitchen. Do you use it anywhere else in the house? In the bathroom, say? Oh, no. We've never had any trouble anywhere else. We get the odd wasp in the summer sometimes, but I don't bother about them. It's the cockroaches I don't like. Nasty, creepy, crawly things. And you find Pestaway does the trick? Well, yes, it's quite good. It gets rid of most of them. How long have you been using it, madam? Oh, let's see. About two years now, I think. About two years. And how often do you find you have to spray? Oh, I give the kitchen a good spray round the skirtings and under the stove, you know, about every six weeks. Every six weeks or so, I see. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. About every six weeks. Every six weeks or so, I see. Uh, where do you buy your pest away, madam? A supermarket? Chemist? Oh, no. I get it at the little shop at the end of this street. They stock practically everything. It means taking a bus if I want to go to the supermarket. Well, thank you very much, madam. Oh, could I have your name, please? Mrs Edgerton. Mary Edgerton. That's E-G-E-R-T-O-N. E-G-E-R-T-O-N. And the address? The address is 12 Holly, Peterford. 12 Peterford. And may I ask your age, madam? Oh, well, just put down I'm over 50. As you like, Mrs Egerton. And occupation? Housewife? Well, I used to be a telephonist before I married. I had a very good job at the post office, but what with a husband to look after and four children to bring up, it doesn't leave you much time, does it? Occupation, housewife. Well, thank you very much for your time, madam. You've been most helpful. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hi, Joanna. What's the matter? You look a bit depressed. Hi, Kamal. I've just been reading this article in the newspaper about how difficult it is for sociology students to get a job after they graduate. They always want people with work experience. How do you get work experience if they won't give you a job? It's an impossible situation. Yes, I know. It's a real problem. And the article says that some people spend a year or more living at home doing unpaid voluntary work just to get something to put on their CVs. Really boring stuff like photocopying and addressing envelopes. I don't want to do anything like that. I want a real job. It's the elections for the Students' Union committee posts next month here at the university. All the positions are up for election. Academic officer, sports What's officer... What's your point? And the position of equal opportunities officer is coming up for election. I'm still not sure what you're getting at. Why don't you stand for it? The post starts in June. You're well known at the university, and I think you would be good at it. Equal opportunities officer? That sounds great. Isn't that the students' union officer who promotes equality within the university? Yes, that's right. They raise awareness of equal opportunities for everyone in the university and promote the issue around campus. 
I'd love to do something for women on campus, but what about my studies? It's a paid sabbatical post. Sabbatical? Yes. That means you take a year off and then start your studies again. Meanwhile, you get really good work experience and you can earn money at the same time. That sounds really interesting. But how do I get elected? You go to the students' union, fill in an application form and just give it to the union. Then, I guess, you need to put together a manifesto and try to get people to support you. I'll help you with your campaign and I'll help you with publicity materials like posters for the notice boards and leaflets to hand out to everyone. It sounds really exciting. What exactly does the Equal Opportunities Officer do? I'm not really sure. Let's have a look at the Students' Union website. There it is. Hmm. The Equal Opportunities Officer is responsible for anything which concerns women and equal rights and is responsible to the Students' Union Executive Committee for making sure that any racism or sexism is dealt with. Students' Union officers have to be available for students to talk about any problems they have and try to help them. I would love that part of the job, giving help and advice to students. The whole reason I want to work in social services is to help people. That would be very good experience. It's a big responsibility too. It also says that you're in charge of a budget and you would be responsible for managing a team of people. It's good experience for a management position in the future. Now I'm getting really excited. What about the day-to-day -day responsibilities? It says here that the Equal Opportunities Officer acts on any health and safety issues. The Equal Opportunities Officer represents all the students on university committees like the Safety Committee and the Equal Opportunities Committee. Lots of meetings, then. I don't think I would enjoy all those meetings quite so much. My first aid certificate might be useful for safety issues. Very useful. And you would supervise the running of the crash, make sure that students with young children have access to childcare, that sort of thing. Oh, look, the Equal Opportunities Officer also has responsibility for the university bus service. Perhaps I could even get it to run on time. No, don't be too ambitious. We have to get you elected first. Let's take a walk to the union office. Maybe we can meet the Equal Opportunities Officer and talk to her about the job. Great, let's go. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. That's about all I want to say about the course and coursework. As you heard, it's very intensive and there's a lot of work to do. So, how to deal with all the work? It's really important to make sure you have good study skills. It makes the difference between failing, just passing or doing well on any course. There are workshops given by student service counsellors on study skills. But I just want to put you in the picture with a quick overview of useful study skills. There are five points I want to make here. The main thing is to get organised. The first thing you need to do as soon as you get your timetable and reading list is to draw up a plan of study. Time management is what all students are bad at. Unfortunately, it's what they need to be very good at. Make up a timetable and put in all the things like lab work, lectures, seminars and tutorials that you will attend. Make a note of exactly what work you will do for each of your courses. Where do we get that from? Your lecturer will tell you exactly how you will be assessed at the end of the course. Make sure that you add in time for reading, preparing seminars and so on. Put deadlines into your study plan and put these deadlines into your computer to remind you when they are. With deadlines you need to be realistic and know yourself. Are you the kind of person who leaves things to the last minute? If you are, make sure you remind yourself about deadlines well in advance. Don't leave things to the last minute. That sounds like me. Aim to have a balanced life of academic work a paid job if you need one, and social activities. As a rough guide, you should be doing 40 hours of academic work per week and 5 to 15 hours for a part-time job, no more. The second point is don't be late or miss lectures. Remember, the person giving the lecture is probably the same person who sets your exams. In lectures, you hear information from the person who will be testing you on it you will take much longer to gather it from other sources. Classes offer an opportunity to ask questions about difficult material. 
and you won't miss extra information. Thirdly, make sure that you regularly reread your notes from lectures, books and handouts. This will help you remember what you have done. Finally, two more important points. We expect you to work long hours on your own. The information we give you in tutorials and lectures is just a starting point, often comprising the main points of themes of the subject. After this, it's up to you to go into detail about the topic and be familiar enough on certain points to give a seminar on it if asked. The next and last point is this. You need to think about what you read and any information you get on a topic. We are looking for students who can evaluate material critically, students who can think critically. Students who simply read and remember information do not make as good progress as students who think about the subject and form their own opinions on it, based on looking at the subject from all points of view. So we are not just learning facts and figures. Facts and figures are an important part of learning, but not the most important thing. It's what you do with them that is critical. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good morning, and welcome to this morning's lecture on transport. What I'll be doing today is comparing forms of transport in different countries to see how forms of transport are affected by factors such as geographical landscape and economic development. My focus will be on countries in South America, Europe and Asia. The first country I'd like to look at is Colombia, which is in South America. This is a country where geography plays an important role. Due to the huge amount of mountains and forests in this country, travelling by air is crucial. I don't know if many of you realise this fact, but Colombia was the first country to establish a commercial airline, and in so doing they made aviation history. Today, there are more than 400 airports in Colombia for domestic flights, which highlights the point I made earlier, that air travel is a vital means of transport in this country. Colombia also has a road network of about 48,000 kilometres, linking Colombia to Venezuela and Ecuador. Transport by road is important for trade as well as tourism. Apart from this, there is also a railway system, but it is in need of modernisation. The other means of transport is by steamers, with the Magdalena being the main waterway. Now let's turn to Colombia's neighbour, Venezuela. Once again, we see that internal flights are an important means of transport, as like Colombia, Venezuela has remote areas where flying is the easiest means of travelling from A to B. Trains are not popular, and most of the railway lines are in the highlands, as this is where the iron ore mines are. Trains are an efficient means of transporting the iron ore from the mines to the factories. Thus we can see how transport and the economy are interrelated. Ships are also used extensively in this country, and there are many ports, the main seaports being Puerto Cabello and Guanta. Turning now to Europe. Belgium is a country that boasts one of the most compact railway systems worldwide. Inland waterways, or canals, are also an important means of transport, transporting both freight and people. Belgium also has the third largest seaport in the world, namely Antwerpen. Air travel is also important, although this is not linked to geographical terrain, as is the case in the South American countries we've already looked at. Next, I'd like to look at the United Kingdom. Like Belgium... The UK has inland waterways around 4,000 kilometres, yet only about 17% of these are used for commercial transport. The main inland port is Manchester, and the chief seaport is London, with Southampton taking second place. Air travel is extensive in this country, and there are around 150 airports, the most famous being Heathrow. However, about 90% of passengers in the UK travel by road. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Finally, I'd like to look at two Asian countries. China is a country which reveals how geographical size affects transport development. Roads and railways are widely used, 
and this has led to a huge amount of bridges being built, such as the Yangtze Bridge, which is probably the most widely known. The Yangtze Bridge is 1.6 kilometres long and is built on two levels. The upper tier is for cars and pedestrians, while the lower is for trains. Railways are especially important, and over 80% of freight and passengers are transported by rail. With such a high proportion of people using trains, it is not surprising that governments in countries like China are prepared to invest in the railway system. Obviously, a fast and effective train service will encourage businesses and the general public to continue using it. The last country I'm going to mention is Japan, which has one of the most advanced transport systems in the world. The railway system is highly developed, and the Takedo Railway, connecting Tokyo and Osaka, has trains that can travel up to 250 kilometres per hour. Ships are also a vital means of transport in both international and domestic areas. To summarise, we can see that transport varies throughout the world, yet the importance of transport networks, be they air, sea, rail or road, cannot be underestimated. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hi, I'm Emma Bailey and today I'm going to be talking baby talk. Hopefully you'll find the subject interesting rather than infantile. I'd like to start by getting you to imagine a scenario. You're in an office or at a family gathering when a mother comes in with her young baby. Like everyone else, you want to see the mother and baby, and you probably want to talk to the baby. How do you do this? What kind of language do you use? Recent research has shown that adults all talk to babies in similar ways. They repeat phrases over and over again in a high-pitched sing-song voice with long vowel sounds. And if they ask questions, they exaggerate their intonation. Researchers have discovered that this kind of language, which they have called motherese, is used by adults all over the world when they talk to babies. And according to a new theory, motherese forms a kind of framework for the development of language in children. This baby talk, so the theory goes, itself originated as a response to another aspect of human evolution, walking upright. In contrast to other primates, Humans give birth to babies that are relatively undeveloped. So, whereas a baby chimpanzee can hold on to its four-legged mother and ride along on her back shortly after birth, helpless human babies have to be held and carried everywhere by their upright mothers. Having to hold on to an infant constantly would have made it more difficult for the mother to gather food. In this situation, researchers suggest, Human mothers began putting their babies down beside them while gathering food. To pacify an infant distressed by this separation, the mother would talk to her offspring and continue her search for food. This remote communication system could have marked the start of motherese. As mothers increasingly relied on their voices to control the emotions of their babies and later the actions of their mobile juveniles, words emerged from the jumble of sounds and became conventionalised across human communities, ultimately producing language. Not all anthropologists, however, accept the assumption that early human mothers put their children down when they were looking for food. They point out that even modern parents do not do this. Instead, they prefer to hold their babies in their arms or carry them around in slings. They suggest that early mothers probably made slings of some kind, both for ease of transportation and to keep their babies warm by holding them close to their bodies. If this was the case, they would not have needed to develop a way of comforting or controlling their babies from a distance. It's not only anthropologists, but also linguists who challenge this explanation for how language developed. They say that although the motherese theory may account for the development of speech, it does not explain the development of grammar, nor, they say, does it explain how the sounds that mothers made acquired their meaning. 
Most experts believe that language is a relatively modern invention that appeared in the last 100,000 years or so. But if the latest theory is right, baby talk, and perhaps fully evolved language, was spoken much earlier than that. We know that humans were walking upright one and a half million years ago. This means that mothers may have been putting their babies down at this time and communicating with them in mother ease. We can be sure that this is not the end of the story, as anthropologists and linguists will continue to investigate the origins of this most human of abilities, language. You now have half a minute to check your answers.